and we're going to start now. Good. The floor is yours, Ben. Thank you, Nina, and uh, greetings to, to everybody uh, joining us for today's UN Environmental Management Group Nexus Dialogue, uh, exploring substantive elements of the human right to a healthy environment. Um, we are joined today by, by a distinguished group of panelists and uh, really happy to have you all with us as well. Um, my name is Ben Schachter and I lead OHCHR's work on the environment and climate change. Uh, it's my pleasure to welcome you to this second UN Environmental Management Group Nexus Dialogue on the human right to a healthy environment. Uh, for those of you who couldn't join us uh, for the first dialogue, which took place on the 24th of July, it focused on efforts to promote global recognition of the human right to a healthy environment, as well as its added value. And the second dialogue will focus on an exploration of the substantive elements of the human right to a healthy environment, building on the first. Uh, for each of these dialogues, the recording, uh, background information, and reports are available on the UN Environmental Management Group website. Um, obviously, that actually applies to the first dialogue, the second dialogue we're having right now, so I should have said it will be available uh, following this discussion. Um, our distinguished panelists today will address the rights to participation, access to information, and access to justice in environmental matters, to a non-toxic environment, to protection of biodiversity, and to a safe and stable climate. I would like to thank you all for joining us, uh, and in particular our panelists and the UNEP, OHCHR, and EMG colleagues who played a crucial role in bringing this discussion together. Uh, today's discussion takes place at the margins of the 45th session of the Human Rights Council. This is the third session of the Council to take place under a hybrid virtual slash in-person format owing to COVID-19. And COVID-19 is a critical part of the context in which our discussion takes place and an illustration of the risk of our deteriorating relationship with nature, as well as our failure to cooperate, take evidence-based action, reduce inequalities, and above all else, protect human rights, including the right to a healthy environment. Of particular relevance to today's discussion, happening, uh, events happening in the Council uh, during this session include the presentations of the Special Rapporteur on Toxics, who's joining us today, uh, to the Council, uh, and the negotiations of a resolution on children's rights and the environment. Um, today's discussion includes experts on human rights and the environment who have asked to consider the following questions with respect to UN system engagement with substantive elements of the right to a healthy environment. What are the key entry points for rights-based environmental action at the international, national, and local levels? Where can the UN make the biggest difference through promoting and supporting rights-based environmental action? What are the biggest gaps and inconsistencies in current UN approaches to implementing and mainstreaming the right to a healthy environment and the biodiversity, chemicals and waste, and climate action arenas? The Nexus Dialogue is designed to be an interactive Socratic discussion of these and other issues related to the human right to a healthy environment. After we hear from our panel of experts, your participation will be welcomed. You're invited to raise your hand when you have a relevant comment or question, at which point we will call upon you to turn on your audio and speak to us. Additionally, we invite you to submit resources, questions, comments, and answers in writing using the Zoom question and answer function. Here you can upvote and comment on each other's contributions, which will let the panelists and myself understand what are pressing concerns. Feel free to start sharing your questions now as I mentioned before, recorded playback outcome documents and background documents will be available on the EMG website. Uh, with those introductory remarks, 
Uh, and, and the caveat that, that uh, Satya from the EMG may be joining us um, in, a, in a few minutes, at, at which point I would, I would welcome him to share some introduction, introductory remarks as well. I'd like to open things up to our panel to begin the discussion. And our first panelist is uh, Ms. Astrid Puentes, co-executive director of AIDA. And we've asked her to focus today on right, the right to participation, access to information, and access to justice and environmental decision making. Um, Astrid, you have the floor. Thank you very much, uh, Ben, and everyone for this very important dialogue about the key issues uh, today. Um, so the first thing to have in mind that I wanted to remind ourselves, even though it's very obvious, is that uh, the planet is one and that we are connected with, with the planet. And that, as you mentioned, the pandemic is a reminder of that. Um, and so in a lot of ways, that is one of the key issues that we need to reflect and at the UN and also in all areas is that um, the environmental protection and human rights is connected and should be reflecting this link. Uh, indigenous peoples, by the way, have reminded ourselves that for decades, if not more. Uh, the other element there is to have in mind what happens when environmental protection and human rights are not together. And there we're seeing that there is an imbalance in, uh, at the core and that neither human rights or the environment protection is effective enough. And so these elements is a reminder of the substantive um, elements of the right to healthy environment that we have and have been recognized by, by regional um, systems and the special rapporteur uh, and the guidelines of the, that the special rapporteur has delivered also at the UN uh, and the Human Rights Council about the main elements, both substantive and procedural of the human right to a healthy environment. Um, and I want to especially touch on the procedural aspect, as, as you mentioned, the right to access to information, participation, and access to justice. Because as we all know, the right to a healthy environment is key both uh, for individual and uh, in the individual aspect, but also collective aspect. We can't really talk about um, an individual right to the environment because every only an individual right because every environmental degradation and impact also has impact on the collective. And that's one of the key aspects to also recognize and remember the importance of protecting the procedural rights. So we have to uh, have in mind that uh, protecting effectively the three elements that I mentioned that are also recognized in the Rio 10 uh, principle, the right to participation, information, and access to justice is key. Uh, these rights have been recognized also regionally in the Aarhus Convention, and now more recently in the Escazú Agreement. Um, and we, one of the key challenges that we have is to make these three aspects real. Uh, and we're not seeing that, unfortunately, and we see that, unfortunately, environmental defenders are under fire and are among the human rights defenders community that are more at risk. Mm -hmm. And so every environmental protection and the agendas, the programs that we have regarding the environment needs to remember to have this at the core um, and to remember that participation in decision making processes is key. And I think that this is one of the things that at the UN we need to advance and improve really, because when we talk about the environment and the protection, um, we can't ignore about other realities, uh, inequalities and difficulties to access actual information and participation in decision making, making processes, as I said. So that's one thing uh, that is key. The other thing that I wanted to mention is, again, thinking about the, the connectivity and the link between the environment and the planet is that agendas regarding poverty, eradication, uh, even the private sector and financial sectors are not separate because as we have seen also with the biodiversity crisis and the climate crisis is again, the reminder that we are connected and that uh, an economic growth uh, development or eradication of poverty cannot be 
separate from environmental protection. And that is something that we think that is the biggest challenge that the UN has. Um, and that as a whole, the programs should be working together and collaborating in a way that really incorporates people, uh, indigenous peoples, for example, and local communities in those decision-making processes, not only as part of uh, either victims or, or vulnerable communities, which in a way they are, but especially as part of the solution. And this is something that I think that there's a big opportunity there uh, and a big challenge as <clears throat> well, um, especially in areas like, or regions like Latin America, that is uh, the most unequal region in the world. And so we see that uh, constantly, but also on the opportunities that we have. Um, and the last thing that I wanted to mention in the space that I have is, of course, the importance to recognize, actually, the human right to healthy environment. Because although it's very important, it has been highlighted as important in a lot of environmental treaties and the, uh, even the regional systems, et cetera, it is still pending the specific recognition of the right to a healthy environment at the UN. And this is something that we have, that we think that it needs to meet to move for, forward uh, without any delay and will help in this collaboration of agendas. Thank you. Thank you uh, very much, Astrid, for, for that uh, really helpful introduction to, to these ideas and to, um, you know, and linking it to the call for global recognition of the human right to a healthy environment as well. Um, before continuing with our panel, I, I'd like to turn things over to uh, Satya Tripathi, who's the secretary of the Environmental Management Group, for, for some introductory and welcoming remarks uh, to everybody with us here today. Um, OHCHR is very grateful for the support and collaboration with the Environmental Management Group in, in organizing uh, these Nexus Dialogues. Um, thank you. Over to you, Sacha. Thank you, Ben. Uh, um, and apologies for uh, the confusion. Um, as you can imagine, this is the high-level UN General Assembly week in New York. So one is barely trying to stay above water, um, running from one event to another, although all in the virtual space. So apologies once again. Um, thank you all and, and thank you, colleagues, for being here um, uh, this morning, afternoon, evening, your time uh, around the world. Um, this is a conversation that is extremely important um, in the context of uh, what we are seeing around ourselves right now. So this, uh, uh, on 24th July, we held the introductory dialogue, the right to a healthy environment. Of, and, and this is part of the human rights and environment nexus dialogue series. It provided an overview of the importance and salience of the global recognition of this right. Um, as you know, human rights language in the Paris Agreement and by the HRC has increased demand by member states to address the global recognition and effective implementation of this right, uh, currently recognized by 150 countries. Um, the right to a healthy environment yielded a consensus that dissemination of information and integration of information into regional, national, and local development plans is critical to enhancing accountability across um, all our valued stakeholders. Now, against these outcomes, today's dialogue examining the elements of the right to a healthy environment will focus on the substantive elements underlining this right, including nexus topics such as human rights and biodiversity, a safe climate, human rights and toxic waste, procedural rights and institutions, and what the UN can do to advance rights-based environmental action. Understanding the synergies between environmental protection and human rights is extremely important, especially for the development of the post-2020 global biodiversity framework and sound management of chemicals and waste beyond 2020. I recently saw um, a very telling cartoon that was sent to me um, by Paul Polman, um, very interesting one, which shows uh, uh, the world uh, being confronted with tidal waves and the smallest one being COVID um, and the second, the bigger one being economic crisis and the third one being uh, the climate challenge and the biggest one being the biodiversity collapse. Uh, so we keep 
ignoring these rights at our own peril, even if we give a damn about the 7.8 million species that inhabit the planet, at a very selfish level, we need to be very worried about ourselves and what the biodiversity collapse um, is doing and will do uh, to the web of life that sustains the humans foremost at the expense of everybody else. So this Nexus Dialogue will further support the foundation of tomorrow's supporting rights-based environmental action workshop. Uh, and I certainly hope that uh, many of you can join us again, which facilitates the establishment and scope of an EMG issue management group on human rights and environment, feeding insights into the CBD, Substar, and SBI meetings in 2021. Uh, welcome to today's Nexus Dialogue and a warm thank you for our esteemed colleagues for your expert perspectives. Thank you all. Thank you very much, Satya, for, for those remarks and, and, and highlighting the, the entire sequence of, of dialogues and, and uh, really the insights that we're looking for and, and hoping to get from, from these discussions. Um, I will return now to our panel. Uh, our next panelist is Marcus Oriana, who is the Special Rapporteur on Human Rights and Toxics. Um, recently, having assumed that role and, and made his first uh, presentation to the Council, I believe, um, only yesterday. So, uh, Marcus, uh, we very much look forward to hearing from you. Uh, your insights. Over. There. Thank you. Thank you, Ben. And thank you to the Environmental Management uh, Group uh, for inviting me to present it in this uh, Nexus Dialogue. I'll put on my timer uh, since I understand I only have five minutes um, to start. And uh, this dialogue couldn't be more timely because as the Council receives the call from more, from more than 900 organizations in global civil society worldwide, it is confronted then with the imperative to act. The imperative to act to protect the natural elements of our environment, the environment that sustains our life of dignity. I would say that uh, the uh, recognition of the, uh, the global recognition of the right to healthy environment has another aspect to it, which is the recasting of our identity, the way that we see ourselves, our place in the web of life and ethics of respect to life around us and to one another. This is an element that, uh, that uh, is perhaps um, in addition to the legal and policy dimensions in terms of discourse, in terms of uh, our idea, our understanding of ourselves can make a lasting impact. Uh, in, terms of, um, in terms of content and scope, this question has been asked uh, at the council. What, what, what additional, what, what is new, what, what can the right to health environment contribute that is not already given by the, uh, by the human rights uh, system? And in this regard, we've had, uh, at least since the Stockholm Conference on the Human Environment in 1972, 50 years of discussion on content and, and scope. And at this time, we could say confidently that uh, the jurisprudence of uh, treaty bodies in the human rights courts, uh, the pronouncements and reports of special procedures, all this are key has contributed to an understanding of how environment and human rights come together and the right to a healthy environment operates as a sort of umbrella right that brings all of this together. A couple elements that can be distilled from that, an emphasis on prevention of harm and an emphasis on effective uh, remedies. Yesterday in my uh, presentation to the council, I mentioned the conference room paper pre prepared by my predecessor looking at the case study in, in Kosovo where a blatant case of racial discrimination, environmental racism, the uh, exposure of um, uh, Roma, Ashkali, and Egyptian communities to lead by uh, the United Missions in Kosovo at the time, uh, the, the uh, the report that looked at the situation in detail by the 
by, by the United Nations own human rights uh, uh, experts concluded that individual compensation was due and uh, necessary. And yet the Secretary General of the UN set up a, an unfunded trust fund uh, that has received a meager contribution of just one state, not a member of the council or not a member from the OECD. Um, so there we see the importance of, uh, of effective remedies. And another element that I thought I'd distill is, is the emphasis on vulnerable groups, uh, those who have the least ability to have their voices heard in society. Um, and it may come from places where you least expect, certainly children whose bodies are developing, workers um, that uh, tend to unionize or organize to address occupational health. But I just put in the, in the link um, that um, it, the occupational health issues are not just at the national level. There is a situation involving uh, Panama City with UN workers that was addressed by my mandate and that uh, has obtained a apparently a successful uh, resolution. Um, other elements that uh, I, I think is worth distilling are procedural elements. Astrid uh, mentioned these in, in detail and uh, and her mention of Escazú, I think the Escazú agreement in the Latin America Caribbean region is quite telling because this is an agreement that uh, elaborates further. It implements uh, the procedural standards in principle 10 of the Rio Declaration on, on procedural rights, so information participation and justice. But unlike the Aarhus Convention, so in the European uh, Central Asian space, it contemplates the right to a healthy environment as a guarantee and not just as a preambular uh, uh, wording. Uh, given the time, I thought I'd uh, mention a couple other things in terms of environmental risk. Uh, one of the key elements in the jurisprudence on environment and human rights, and so in the content and scope of the right to a healthy environment is the duty of states to address environmental risks. The choice of means is broad, the discretion of, for states is broad. But as the uh, blast, the colossal blast of thousands of ammonium nitrate, thousands of tons of ammonium nitrate in the port of Beirut reminds us, every state is well aware now and, and cannot ignore its human rights obligations to take action in the face of environmental risk and hazardous substances. And in that sense, it's not just wastes, it is extractive industries, production, management, transport, use, disposal, the life cycle of hazardous substances that is at play. In the couple of minutes uh, that I have left of, of my time, I thought I'd mention one last thing. There is an interplay between national standards and international standards. Uh, when it comes to uh, national law, the right to a healthy environment can be a powerful tool in making sure that national legal standards are observed, whether they're occupational standards for workers or ambient quality or emissions standards or products, food, drugs, um, or even trade. Uh, now, the, the, the trickier question comes with the use of international standards. When national standards are inadequate to offer protection to, the, uh, to a healthy environment, can, uh, can the right to a healthy environment also ref resort to international standards? The, the 2019 decision by the Supreme Court of the Netherlands in the Urgenda case offers a, a positive response to that. It takes um, decisions adopted by the Conference of the Parties of the UN Framework Convention on Climate Change to give content to rights protected under the European Convention on Human Rights. This was in 2019. Back in 2010, the Inter-American Court of Human Rights in the case of Shakmok Kasek had taken a similar approach in a case involving indigenous communities in Paraguay in respect of the right to health, water, education, and food. So we see that in terms of the justiciability of the right to a healthy environment, the relevance of national standards and international standards are key to understanding scope and content of the right. Uh, I understand that my time is up, so thank you for the opportunity to join you and uh, happy to take any questions and comments uh, at the opportune time. Cheers. Thank you very much, Marcus. Um, and, and I'll just flag uh, that in 10 minutes time, we'll be opening up the floor for questions from the audience. So I, I see a number of you have started using the Q&A function. 
uh, which is great. And, and uh, panelists will, will try to respond to those questions in writing or, or later when we open up the floor for them to respond to questions. But please feel free to also raise your hand and you can start doing so now. We'll, we'll note who uh, has asked for the floor and, and come to you uh, in that order if you'd like to have the floor when we open things up for questions in roughly 10 minutes time. Uh, now I'll turn things over to our next panelist, who is Tanya McGregor, a gender program officer with the Convention on Biological Diversity. Um, Tanya, the floor is yours. Thanks very much. Um, I'm just waiting to see the screen share here. Okay. Um, as as uh, thanks Ben, thanks colleagues, and thanks to all who are who are on the call today. I'm very happy to be here and be part of this uh, very interesting and timely discussion. And I know I don't have a lot of time, uh, so I'll just get started with the next slide, where I wanted to give um, just a brief overview of uh, some of the human rights uh, relevant to biodiversity that. Um, play a role in this discussion. So um, I've noted here uh, one of the quotes from the report of this, the UN Special Rapporteur on Human Rights and the Environment that really emphasizes um, the importance of biodiversity for the full enjoyment of human rights. And those rights include um, rights to life and health, uh, such as uh, including the determinants of health, such as food and nutrition, housing, uh, safe and potable water, sanitation, healthy environment. Also more specifically, um, things such as medicinal drugs that are derived from biodiversity and from nature, uh, the transmission of infectious diseases, which uh, stems from biodiversity loss, as we, as we can see in the current pandemic as well as um, the impact on mental health from the access to uh, nature and biodiversity or the lack thereof. There is also the right to an adequate standard of living related to right to food, ensuring food security, which in many cases is uh, very much based on biodiversity, as well as access to clean and safe water, which is linked to such things as increased forest cover. So again, very close relationship to uh, maintenance of biodiversity and functioning ecosystem services. There is also the right to non-discrimination and the enjoyment of rights or um, the rights of those most vulnerable. So here we're talking about indigenous peoples and local communities, women and the poor specifically. Um, also the right to participation in cultural life, uh, wherein um, for many communities and notably indigenous peoples, um, the cultural life is tied to use and of, of land and water resources, among other things. So I'll just move to the next slide, which gives a bit of a context on um, the convention uh, from when it was adopted, the Convention on Biological Diversity. Um, recognitions were set out uh, in the adoption of the convention that looked at things such as the close and traditional uh, dependence of indigenous and local communities on biodiversity, uh, the vital role that women play and their, the need for their full participation in policy making and implementation for, for biodiversity. And also an awareness of the importance of biodiversity for meeting the world's needs, uh, particularly in respect to food and health. So with that, I'll move to the next slide. And here uh, I wanted to um, speak a bit more specifically about the, the draft post-2020 global biodiversity framework. As, as you may know, the framework is currently uh, under negotiation. And this provides an opportunity to highlight linkages between the conservation, sustainable use of biodiversity and the enjoyment of human rights. So I've just identified or laid out some, some of the elements of um, the, the draft framework that have a more specific bearing on rights. And these include um, uh, the vision 2050 of living in harmony with nature, which has been adopted by parties, which refers to the importance of biodiversity and maintaining ecosystems, 
ecosystem services for sustaining both a healthy planet and delivering benefits essential for all people. So the concept of benefits essential for all people or benefits for all people is reflected in many different aspects of the draft framework so far, including the 2030 mission uh, to take action to put biodiversity in a path to recovery for benefit of both the planet and for people. And um, for the 2050 goals, there are four goals and uh, of these, they also, uh, uh, they include uh, the reference to ensuring that nature's contribu contributions to people can support the global de uh, development agenda for the benefit of all people and um, ensuring also that benefits from the, the use of genetic resources are shared fairly and equitably. And also to note that the theory of change on which the framework has been based takes into account the importance of implementing the framework in, through a rights-based approach and recognizing among, the, among others the principles of intergenerational equity. So I'll just move on to the next slide, thanks. So similar to the, the uh, current strategic plan for biodiversity and its uh, 20 IG biodiversity targets, the um, post-2020 global biodiversity framework uh, proposes to include a set of 20 targets again. So I've just identified a number of them here that have more specific bearing on uh, relationships to um, rights to a healthy environment. So this includes such things as ensuring uh, benefits uh, to nutrition, food security, livelihoods, health and well-being, especially for the most vulnerable. Uh, looking at biodiversity's contributions to the regulation of air quality, hazards, extreme events, and the quality and quantity of water. Looking at benefits uh, from biodiversity in green and blue spaces for human health and well-being. Um, looking also at the increase of benefits uh, related to uh, uh, the uh, use of genetic resources and associated traditional knowledge, and also uh, identifying the importance of traditional knowledge in the promotion uh, and of awareness and education and research related to management of biodiversity. And notably is target 20, which has two key elements uh, that are proposed. Uh, these include the equitable participation in, in decision-making and ensuring rights over relevant resources this for Indigenous peoples and local communities, for women and girls, and for youth. So just to note again, this is, this is proposed language, but it, it um, does put forward a series of, of um, or does recognize the types of benefits that are relevant for people and, and the types of actions that can be taken by different, uh, that need to be taken by um, um, parties and by different actors uh, to support the full implementation of the framework. So I'll just move on to the next slide. And um, just briefly to touch on uh, a series of enabling conditions that are also put forward in the framework that, um, that talk about um, supporting the implementation of the framework, which relate to participation of indigenous peoples and local communities, participation of relevant stakeholders, gender equality and gender responsive approaches, and recognition of intergenerational equity, as well as um, a, considering and recognizing the rights of nature. So I'm just gonna move on very quickly to my last slide because I'm running out of time. Um, and I just wanted to raise this question that we can consider further in the discussion. And I've, I've identified some points here as a, as a basis and a bit of a jumping off point, but um, the, the post-2020 framework is meant to be a transformative and um, ambitious agenda. So in, in what ways can we ensure that the framework and its implementation promote transformational change for the realization of human rights related to biodiversity? So I've just identified here some, some inputs that have uh, been proposed from uh, workshops that have been undertaken on the, uh, by different partners um, in the context of the preparation of the framework. So I won't go into the list here, but they do include, among others, a uh, proposal for a specific recognition of the right to a healthy environment, um, looking also at the, the rights to land for IPLCs, for Indigenous peoples and local communities, as well as for women, um, as well as identifying the importance of protection for environmental defenders. Um, 
and looking at women's leadership participation access. So with that, I, um, I will just move to my last slide, um, which is just, just a very simply thank you. And I look forward to discussing this uh, more fully um, in, in the conversation this morning or today. Thanks. Thank you, Tanya, uh, for highlighting uh, in particular some of the very specific areas where um, human rights uh, could be integrated uh, within the post-2020 global biodiversity framework. Um, so our final panelist is Sebastian Doik, a senior attorney with the Center for International Environmental Law, um, working uh, on climate change and other issues, uh, but asked to speak today um, about entry points for rights-based uh, climate action. Um, over to you, Sebastian. Good afternoon, good morning, everyone. I'm trying to share my screen, but facing some logistical <laughs> challenges. So I will start my presentation in a second. Um, so maybe Excellent. just while Sebastian's getting his screen up, uh, a reminder to continue using the Q&A function and raise your hand if you would like to take the floor uh, following this final uh, presentation from our panelists. Back to you, Sebastian. Thank you, Ben. Um, and as the other panelists, I would like to thank the organizer for organizing such a timely event, um, particularly because as several of you have mentioned, we've heard at the Human Rights Council uh, that uh, a global call from civil society and indigenous peoples organization was launched calling upon the UN member states to recognize the right to healthy environments. And this launch just um, was um, communicated at the time of the ongoing Human Rights Council session. So that's an extremely timely conversation to have. Um, and I'm going to focus on, on the linkages um, between human rights and climate change and right-based um, climate action. Um, when I hope that you can see the screen. Um, when discussing the impact of climate change on human rights, um, it's very difficult, unfortunately, to, to pick one very symbolic representation of it because as the IPCC has been uh, explaining very explicitly and as more and more communities uh, are witnessing, um, there is a broad diversity of impacts on human rights by climate change, impacting communities all around the planet and indigenous peoples, uh, but also having a multitude of impacts, whether it's due to extreme weather events or um, slow onset events such as desertification or increase of rainfall, um, and so nowadays, unfortunately, there's no more question on whether or not there is a strong human rights dimension of climate change in itself. But um, as the High Commissioner for Human Rights has mentioned, this can be considered one of the greatest ever threat to human rights. And so this is really why the question of are we going to be in a position to integrate human rights, to leverage human rights, to face climate action, it's really now uh, representing a kind of litmus, litmus test for the United Nations to understand whether 75 years after um, the establishment of a new uh, global order that we live in, there is still um, a possibility for the United Nations and its member state to, to raise to this global challenge. Um, the IPCC, however, also focused on some of the positive linkages between human rights and climate change. And here I have a few quotes from the IPCC, maybe I'll just read the first one, but the IPCC in its report on uh, global warming by 1.5 degree flagged that civil society is to a great extent the only reliable motor for driving institutions to change at the pace required. And in many different chapters of uh, their reports, the IPCC has developed um, scientific uh, knowledge base on how actually integrating human rights, uh, making human rights your starting point for climate action. So particularly, for instance, uh, questions of public participation, access to information, protection of uh, defenders, but also gender um, equality and women empowerment are really critical, actually, um, critical elements that enable you to have more climate, more effective climate action and more resilient climate action. So actually, um, to combat climate change effectively, the IPCC has been um, very strongly um, acknowledging recently the fact that human rights need to be placed at the core of climate action. 
And to give one particular um, example, for instance, when we think about the role of ecosystem in actually um, helping us combat um, human-induced climate change, um, we see that one of the most effective way um, to, uh, for states to combat climate change is actually to focus on strengthening land tenure rights and the rights of local communities and indigenous peoples, uh, their forest rights, their participation rights, um, because that's one of the most, uh, possibly the most effective policy that you can implement as a state to actually um, sequestrate uh, or protect uh, ecosystem that secretes secret threat um, carbon. And so actually uh, there is um, empirical evidence that demonstrates how ignoring rights is um, not just uh, very harmful from the point of view of communities and indigenous peoples, but also it's a recipe for disaster from a climate perspective. At the same time, unfortunately, we also see now a growing number of cases in which policies are being rushed, are being motivated by the urgency of climate change um, and are implemented in violation of the rights of indigenous peoples, whether it's a uh, construction of a hydroelectrical uh, power plant here in Panama or um, forest-based project in Kenya or many other projects around the planet. Unfortunately, we see that too often the urgency of climate change has now motivated some actors, whether they're um, corporate actors or, or states to actually ignore existing rights um, of local communities and indigenous peoples. Um, and so this is another very important challenge that the community now faces, um, ensuring that no action responding to climate change actually is implemented at the cost of the rights of local communities and indigenous peoples. We had, however, as it was mentioned in the introductionary world, this breakthrough in terms of trying to integrate human rights and climate change with the 2015 Paris Climate Agreement and this broad vision uh, that was considered groundbreaking by, by so many of actors, uh, including many on this call. The Paris Climate Agreement, if you only look at its preamble, has so many references to human rights related uh, principles. Uh, there is clearly a reference to human rights also to the rights of indigenous peoples, to gender equality and the empowerment of women, to public participation and access to information, to dress transition, um, echoing the economic and social rights that have been protected for a very long time, to food security, and also to ecosystem integrity. And all of those principles are highlighted as um, building block in order to deliver what the Paris Agreement is all about, that is ambition in climate action and, and equity. The, the challenge, uh, of course, is um, why do we have this 2015 breaking point um, so long after the establishment of the United Nations? Why is so much time lost in integrating those elements while actually human rights is one of the three pillars of the United Nations? And we've just been celebrating this week at the, in New York um, the 75th anniversary of the United Nations. And only now recently do we see actually an integration of human rights in environmental responses. And so um, basically um, what Paris did was not to develop any new framework, but rather to um, try to integrate what already had been developed for so many decades and bring this back uh, in the context of climate governance to make sure that um, we will take away the, the blind spots um, in climate responses. And this is particularly important because um, as others have mentioned during this call, um, there's been so many developments at UN human rights treaty bodies, by UN special rapporteur, by um, human rights institutions uh, at the regional or also national level, establishing the linkages between um, climate change and human rights or being environmental action and human rights. The challenge that we see even after 2015 now is the challenge, the difficulty to really implement this full vision that is uh, represented in the Paris Agreement. Um, when we see the way that states communicate about their climate action, uh, actually uh, more um, in the majority of cases, states actually um, fail to report back to communicate how they actually have integrated effectively the existing human rights obligation in the context of their climate responses. And so um, this is now the, the challenge for states, but also for the United Nations. Um, how can we make sure that we reflect this vision of policy coherence that the Paris Agreement captured in climate responses? How do we make sure that human rights are at the core of climate responses in a very explicit manner? Um, not just integrating the words human rights, but really thinking about the role of, for instance, um, 
gender equality and the rights of indigenous peoples at the core of all of those climate responses. And so this uh, leads me to, to the final slide for today. I know that this responds to a cliche in the United Nations conversation, but unfortunately, um, what is critical right now is really to break the silos, to really integrate in um, the environmental governance uh, spaces, those existing human rights obligations that have existed for such a long time, and that actually so many institutions that states have willingly um, abided to making sure now that we can integrate those obligations into those environmental responses. And unfortunately, those silos are only a construction of the mind of our institutions. And so um, it is really um, critical for us to actually, and for the United Nations, to challenge those um, boundaries that um, exist between different legal uh, spheres and making sure that human rights is never considered as something that other institutions have to deal with, but really as one of the three pillars of any in UN institution and be systematically integrated in the work that uh, UN agencies and secretariats are uh, implementing um, with member states. And I will conclude my reference here. I've seen some extremely interesting questions, but I will try to respond to some of them in writing. Thank you, uh, Sebastian, and, and uh, many thanks to all of our panelists. Uh, this is normally when we would ask for a round of applause, um, <laughs> but I guess it would be just the sound of one person clapping. Um, we're really grateful uh, to you for joining us, and I'm, I'm sure the audience is as well. We've had a number of questions uh, posed in the Q&A. Uh, so far, no hands have been raised. Um, I will just remind you that, that you can feel free to raise your hand and comment or ask questions directly. Um, but in the meantime, we'll turn to the questions uh, which have been asked in writing, and, and I'll be asking uh, panelists to, to respond to those. Um, so, uh, we have a question on the human universal recognition of the human right to a healthy environment and its relevance to the development of mandatory human rights due diligence legislation, such as in Germany and at the EU level. Um, we have a comment uh, sharing with us the um, call um, for global recognition of the human right to a healthy environment by a number of civil society and indigenous peoples organizations now signed by more than 950 such organizations uh, and welcome people to share uh, their thoughts on, on that. Um, we have another question on access to information as an important condition for enabling participation and discussion on biodiversity. And uh, we have a request that people try to use plain language and avoid um, using acronyms as uh, not all of the terms that we use are familiar to, to everybody in the audience. And um, we have a question as well related to uh, rights of nature and uh, where that particular discussion is going. So a lot of different questions. Uh, I'll try to direct some of these, but encourage the panelists to, to respond to um, any of the questions that, that they would like to. And I, I apologize, I think I missed, there was also a question about the post 2020 uh, global biodiversity framework uh, and and the drafts over time uh, changing and in the current draft no longer including the right to a healthy environment. So um, those are all quite uh, interesting subjects uh, for us to delve into. Uh, I will start uh, with with Astrid, if that's all right, Astrid. And perhaps in particular, uh, you, you may want to say a few words about access to information and also about uh, the rights of nature and, and the discussion there um, and the way it's changed um, over time. 
Thank you, Ben. Um, I tried to answer that first question in writing, but yes, it's better, I think, to have the dialogue. Um, again, I think that the achieving the global recognition of the human right to a healthy environment can really help uh, to advance uh, this discussion about even the right to nature, because it will uh, recognize what is already there and what we all have mentioned in terms of the element and this discussion that has been gone for 50 years almost, and it's the link uh, between the environment and human rights. So, um, so this is one, one step that we think that is key uh, so that we can advance uh, the recognition of the rights to nature has advanced in different jurisdictions. Um, we already have the Constitution of Bolivia and Ecuador recognizing specifically the right to nature um, and then other jurisdictions in jurisprudences, including in Colombia and New Zealand, to recognize rights to, uh, for example, the Amazon and rivers, um, which is great and has helped. One thing that I want to highlight again is that in practice and in reality, we still are very far from the results that we need. And scientists and numbers have been uh, reminding us uh, painfully, I think, about this, and we uh, said, uh, quoted the IPCC, um, the biodiversity crisis also has been reflected in the IPBS reports. Um, and so more than the paper on the rights, we need to advance in, um, in reality. And I want to link this with the due diligence um, question and the answer, I think that is absolutely yes, businesses and enterprises um, and financial sector have also an obligation to protect the environment and this has to be included in due, 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 due vigilance oh my god it's too early for my brain still um, because uh, again the reality and the impact of business and the private sector this is one of the things that we're seeing um, i want to remind ourselves that uh, also there are uh, reports about how seven, about 70% of the emissions globally are linked to 100 or so businesses. And so this reminds ourselves that it's not only uh, the UN that is in charge of protecting the rights, human rights and the environment, but it's everybody and that the impact and uh, the, the reality again has shown that we definitely have to have everyone in board, including the private sector, uh, and and uh, if businesses have and are thinking about due diligence, definitely the well-being of the planet uh, and the survival of humanity should be included on that. Thank you uh, so much, Astrid. And, and in particular on the, this question about businesses and, and human rights due diligence, I, I wanted to to turn to you, Marcus, uh, for, for some quick thoughts on, on this in the context of uh, toxics and, and the human rights obligations related to toxics and, and uh, right to a healthy environment in this particular context. Over to you, Marcus. Uh, th thanks, Ben. Yes, yeah, so uh, reflecting on, uh, on Astrid's um, comments and, and looking at the, at the bigger picture of, of due diligence, um, one starting point uh, for the discussion is to recall the, the, the 2011 uh, Prince, UN Principles on Business and Human Rights, which articulates a framework for, uh, for business responsibilities on human rights and anticipates due diligence as a key element of that. Uh, and why is that? Uh, for, for several reasons. One is that uh, information is critical in this area. Information enables action to address risks. Information um, is, is thus the gateway that uh, society and businesses uh, have um, in order to uh, deal with the uh, deleterious impacts of their practices. But it's not just information, it's applying the information in, in management practices. So far, um, much of the emphasis in the implementation of, uh, of uh, the business and human rights principles has been on, on national policies and, and action plans um, across uh, the um, operations of businesses, products, uh, supply chains, downstream impacts, and, and so forth. Uh, but at the same time, the impact of that in almost 10 years has been limited. And, and so there's been increasing calls for a strong, um, mandatory due diligence also for the implementation of the right to a healthy environment. And that's uh, 
um, that explains the movement towards uh, the negotiation of a treaty on transnational corporations and other business entities that would make it mandatory for states to pass national laws establishing due diligence uh, along all these elements that I've mentioned. It's, it's operations, uh, product supply chains, downstream impacts, uh, so the, the, the whole life cycle of operations as it were. Uh, so that's, that's one observation. The second observation I would make in terms of human rights responsibilities, specifically in the toxic space, goes to the, um, the science policy interface. We've seen that at the international level, the Rotterdam Convention on, on uh, largely on, on transboundary movements of, um, of chemicals and, and pesticides has been blocked by certain countries that uh, at the Conference of the Parties refuse to um, agree on a consensus and the recommendations of the of the science uh, and so the listing of chemicals has been has been blocked for political reasons industry also largely behind the position of these states there are countless examples of disinformation campaigns the the deliberate spread of false information to delay to divert attention Climate change is no doubt a prime example, as is tobacco and secondhand smoke, pharmaceuticals. But in the chemicals and space, we can talk about beryllium in the aerospace industry or diacetyl in the, in the popcorn, uh, the milk dairy substitutes or, or chromium in metallurgy or aromatic amines, which since 1921, the International Labor Organization has reports on this, and still there are disinformation campaigns, and not to mention lead in gasoline and paint. So there's a huge question about business human rights responsibilities in spreading false information, in funding disinformation campaigns to obfuscate information in society. Will inter the international community be able to address these problems? That's one of the big questions posed to the International Chemicals Conference, uh, International Conference on Chemicals Management, um, the fifth one scheduled for next year, that will have to deal with the fact that, as reported by the UN Environment Program last year, the international community has miserably failed to reach the global 2020 chemicals goal that was articulated back in Johannesburg in, in 2001. Will, it have, will we have voluntary or mon mandatory approaches? Will we continue to deal with one chemical at a time or will we have holistic approaches to chemicals of global concern? Will we have effective means of compliance and information? All of that comes together in thinking about how the right to a healthy environment can really strengthen the international community's approach to chemicals and wastes, and specifically to your question on how the right to a healthy environment can inform human rights responsibilities of businesses. Thank you. Thank you very much, Marcus. Um, we, we have a, a, quite a few questions in the Q&A about the post-2020 uh, global biodiversity framework. We also have a hand uh, from Noel Campo, one of the, the questioners. So perhaps before turning things over to you, Tanya, to, to try to address some of those questions, we can hear uh, from Noel uh, directly. Nina, can you, can you pass the floor to Noel? Who are past? Hello, can you hear me? Yes. Great, thanks. Oh, uh, yeah, so I, I typed this into the chat box, but um, we'd basically be really interested to hear your thoughts on how the human right to a healthy environment could be concretely um, incorporated into the um, post 2020 global biodiversity framework. So you kind of listed the enabling conditions, but are there ways we can incorporate it into a concrete target uh, indicators so that we're not, states are not just recognized, firstly, they, it's very important they recognize um, this right, but then how, how are we tracking progress in terms of implementing it, ensure, ensuring that we're you know, addressing environmental defenders, for example. Um, so are there any kind of concrete um, ways we could incorporate it into the, into the framework? Thanks. Thank you, Noel, and over to you, Tanya. Uh, thanks very much. Uh, thanks, Noel, and thanks. I, I seen uh, some other comments and the questions in the chat that are uh, similar along the lines of how do we incorporate um, 
these types of concepts in, in the post-2020 framework. And I think this, this speaks to some of the challenges that um, have been raised in the discussion so far. I think there is uh, an increasing recognition by, by states and, um, and civil society of the relationships between human rights and, and biodiversity, but um, there is still that resistance that uh, remains and the reluctance to, uh, by some parties perhaps to, uh, to take on the, the full um, obligations entailed in, in addressing such rights. So I think in terms of the, the context of the framework, there is, there is still time, certainly. We, we even have more time now that the, the negotiations have been extended. Um, so it does give us the opportunity to have this conversation with, uh, specifically with parties who are um, leading on the, on the forefront of human rights issues and, and others who may be more resistant to, to really um, <clears throat> look at ways which may be of, um, uh, <clears throat> I guess, more uh, language can be determined that can uh, can address these issues in a in a way that is acceptable to a broader range of stakeholders. Um, as I as I put forward in my presentation, the um, there was uh, an input that, that came from the um, human rights. Uh, human rights thematic workshop that proposed to have a target um, specifically on the recognition of rights to a healthy environment. Um, whether or not it could be stated as such um, is a question, but I think it is also very important to look at <clears throat> what indicators could be used and what indicators are available at at the global level um, and, and what the capacity or the needs are to measure relevant indices um, at national levels so that um, these things can be proposed um, for the framework. Because I think it's, it's also important to consider um, the, the implementation as much as it's, it's critical um, to ensure that we have a set of, of targets and goals that um, clearly relate and uh, reflect human rights and, and um, issues of gender equality in Indigenous peoples and local communities. It is equally important to ensure that uh, states have the capacity and um, uh, and are able and, and understanding and, and I guess um, able to take action at those levels because we can, um, we can see from, from the current strategic plan on biodiversity and the IG biodiversity targets that we have not reached the targets that were set in 2010 for 2020. Um, so it is, it is also the question of um, what needs to be done to advance implementation and part of that role from civil society is, is um, making information available, engaging in dialogue, and um, trying to ensure that the links are, are um, at the forefront of discussions as, as much as possible. Thank you uh, very much, Tanya. Um, we have a couple more hands from the floor, but I also want to respond um, and give Sebastian uh, an opportunity to respond to a couple of the comments in the Q&A before turning over to them. And, and so just a reminder, anybody else who would like an opportunity to speak, uh, please raise your hand in the next couple of minutes uh, so, that, so that we make sure we can get you in there. Um, to, to you, Sebastian, I wanted to, to ask if you could share some thoughts about the CSO call for global recognition of the human right to health the environment, and um, perhaps as well about the work um, of the council this session uh, related to children's rights and the environment. To you. Thank you. And uh, so to echo the comments that were already made based in this uh, global call launched at this session now, endorsed by more than 950 organizations, um, gathering organizations from the environmental sphere, but also organizations that have been traditionally working with human rights. Um, so it's a, a great convergence of those two agendas. Civil society definitely also has its own silos to break. And so I think we recognize that very much. Um, the, 
purpose of the code is really to call on uh, the member states of the United Nations to recognize through a human rights council resolution the right to a healthy environment and to do this promptly because um, it is perceived increasingly as a, a major gap and the lack of recognition is probably uh, something that actually contributes to having those, um, those silos remaining and um, increasing the challenge to make those bridges between the environmental work that a lot of UN institutions are doing on states at the national level and the human rights agendas and frameworks that have been developed uh, over many decades. Um, so this is really a code that is now gaining momentum and we've seen uh, several um, key authorities endorsing or supporting the, the global call already, including the special rapporteur Orellana uh, in his intervention yesterday, who, who highlighted the importance for the United Nations to really hear the call uh, coming outside of the UN um, and uh, calling for the, the UN to reconcile those two agendas. Um, so this is something that um, I think would be very interesting to, to monitor in the future, but I think one of the key is also then to make sure that this global recognition is anyway translated into the main environmental agendas that are uh, moving forward. And so while well, the Paris Agreement has its uh, preamble, but now is struggling to be implemented, I think we face the same questions for the CBD, to what extent um, this um, recognition of the, the linkages between environment and human rights really actually inform all of the targets um, both from the perspective of really focusing on gender empowerment and the rights of local communities and indigenous peoples, but also in ensuring that the, the urge to conserve certain areas doesn't come at the cost of the rights of uh, the communities and the peoples that are already established in those. And, uh, so there are a lot of things on the, the agenda um, under the Convention for Biological Diversity that are related to this. Very briefly, in relation to the Human Rights Council and its resolution on children's rights, it is being negotiated at the moment. Uh, there were some discussion earlier today related to this, and the focus this year is on um, the rights of children in the context, uh, in environmental context. And so I think one of the, the elements that will be critical in terms of follow up is, for instance, um, what does procedural rights mean in the context of uh, children, and how do we make sure that we really guarantee? the rights of children to have their voice heard on decisions that impact their long-time uh, benefits and um, well-being, but also have access to justice. And for procedural rights for children is something, for instance, that is really um, not recognized to a level that um, we should in the context of those long-term environmental threats and the decisions being made now. So this is maybe one area that would be particularly interesting to monitor. Thank you, Sebastian. Um, and so now I will re return to our audience for, for a couple of comments um, and just uh, flag to our panelists that, that I'll likely be coming back to you for your final remarks uh, after we hear from the audience the, their next couple of questions. Um, so please uh, you know, think about responding to the questions as well as if there's anything else that, that you want to impart to, to us uh, in, in, in those final comments. And you should have a couple of minutes uh, each to do so. Um, so I have a hand from Ava Marie Okoff. Can we have the floor to Ava? We're giving. Thank you. Hello, can you hear me? Okay, thank you so much for the presentations and a very interesting discussion indeed. So I'm very curious, um, specifically regarding public participation, because based on our experience, we've seen that um, most of the time public participation is conducted in a very formalistic way. And there's always been a gap that's always coming up in terms of how do you measure the effectiveness of the process? Is this something that can be incorporated in um, the procedural aspects of the right to environment and how can this be done? Thank you. Okay, thank you, Ava. And we also have a request for the floor from Sarah Mead. Uh, if there are any other requests, uh, make them now. And over to you, Sarah Mead. Sorry. Sarah lowered her hand. Okay, 
So um, any other requests for the floor then? We'll, we'll leave that open for a couple of seconds and, and then uh, be returning to our panelists uh, for their, their final comments uh, in reverse order to, to the one we started with. Uh, so you got about 10 seconds warning for that, Sebastian. Um, okay. So, Sebastian, uh, response to the question um, on participation uh, and or any final thoughts about how the, the work of the UN Environmental Management Group can more effectively uh, promote rights-based environmental action, responding to um, what you've heard today from your fellow panelists and, and from the audience. Um, you know, what, what uh, concrete ideas might you have for next steps and ways forward? Over to you. So on, on the question related to public participation, what I will say briefly is that um, public participation or procedural rights are really a, a sort of prerequisite for uh, the enjoyment of the right to a healthy environment. And they are great tools um, in Latin America and the Caribbean with the Escazo Agreement in Europe and Central Asia and soon in Africa, actually, with the uh, OWS Convention, since non-European countries can also ratify this a wonderful instrument. And so those instruments really actually go beyond just the, the concept of public participation, which really focus on what is a right-based, uh, actually, approach to public participation. And so whenever we discuss right-based environmental action, I think it's great to go back to the Escazoo Agreement, the OWS Convention, and see actually where is the focus on discrimination, on those most marginalized on making sure that everyone enjoys this right and not just the most privileged. So we say that uh, indeed it's definitely a, a critical component. And, uh, and I will encourage everyone here to, to continue promoting those tools, whether it's accelerating ratification in Latin America and the Caribbean of the Escazoo Agreement or encouraging other states to consider uh, perhaps uh, acceding to the OWS Convention, even if outside of the, the region from which this instrument emerged. Um, and then very briefly, what I could say for the environmental management group, I think it's really its responsibility 75 years after the establishment of the United Nations to really um, break down those silos that uh, often, too often come and limit the mandate of different institutions so that uh, actually all UN bodies really are strong champions uh, that fully feel um, empowered by all of those existing UN human rights mandates. And what I can just say is that um, in the conversation related to the Paris Agreement and human rights references there, there were a lot of discussion on whether it's a great place to really bring in those existing obligations and what we keep kept replying to states that um, question whether this was the right discussion to have is that every state that is a party to those environmental agreements ratified at least three legally binding human rights agreements. So it's really not a question of pushing um, different agendas in the wrong venue, but just helping states integrate all those obligations that they have already committed to uh, in a very, uh, in a process that has always been very respectful of their national sovereignty. Thank you very much, Sebastian. Um, and Tanya, uh, really the, the same question or set of questions uh, to you and, and specifically thinking in the context of uh, the, C the Convention on Biological Diversity and the post-2020 global biodiversity framework. Over to you. Yeah, thanks very much. I'd like to say thanks uh, to all of the participants for the questions and, and um, all of the panelists here for very interesting presentations. Um, I keep yeah, there's a, a, a few different things that, that keep coming to mind, but I don't want to lose them in, in my comments here. Uh, but one is um, related to the, the idea of silos. And I think in the context of the, the post-2020 framework, we already have uh, the model of the Sustainable Development Goals and Agenda 2030 for Sustainable Development, which which takes a strong approach to integrating uh, gender equality and women's empowerment and um, focusing on the message that no one should be left behind. Um, 
trying to ensure um, an integrated approach that looks at the social dimensions, uh, economic dimensions, and environmental dimensions of development. So I think um, the post 2020 framework is is an opportunity to really support parties in in um, the achievement of the SDGs. So making those links clearly and strongly um, is is an opportunity to kind of advance that agenda under the the, the post 2020 framework. And I'd say also um, perhaps we can um, do a better job in breaking down those silos as well in terms of looking at uh, the other Rio conventions and what has been done under the Climate Change Convention, the Convention to Combat Desertification. One of the things that comes to mind for me is um, the the really strong uh, gender constituency under the, the Climate Change Convention and the push, um, including this year under the Generation Equality Banner on um, gender and climate justice. And and the language there is always about gender and climate. It doesn't necessarily, it doesn't um, directly uh, include uh, a focus on biodiversity. And so we see that some of the parties that are engaged in this discussion under the Climate Change Convention are not necessarily um, putting those things, those messages forward under the Biodiversity Convention. So it's, it's trying to make sure that um, we do our part um, from the UN side, but also trying to support countries and really seeing those linkages and making those linkages in um, in these different frameworks because we are talking very much about the same things. And so there's there's an opportunity lost if we are not building on the gains and supporting um, the concerted achievement of, of these objectives. Um, and one of the other things I wanted to say in the context of participation uh, as, as I I referenced in my in my presentation that the there is an emphasis on participation in, uh, so far in the post 2020 framework related to the, the enabling conditions as well as some specific targets. Uh, one of the messages that um, has come through in discussions on um, gender equality and gender responsive approaches is really uh, emphasizing meaning participation. So also looking at the leadership of women and opportunities to um, uh, support um, greater involvement in processes at all levels. So as much as that is um, referenced and put forward in the preamble of the convention, there's still a lot of room to act on that and to take that forward um, in at the national level uh, in, in different countries. And I would say that is not just in the context of developing countries, it's also very relevant for developed countries. And I think um, just coming to, to one of the points you were mentioning as well, Sebastian, is, is just this, I think we, <clears throat> we have still encountered somewhat of a resistance in, in um, uh, looking at uh, in the space in which we discuss biodiversity to also be discussing things uh, related to gender, related to human rights. And I think it's, it's trying to really um, make those messages clear to parties and, and, and the linkages clear enough so that it is understood that we, these conversations are not separate <laughs> and they, they need to be discussed in, in the same spaces and all of the spaces that we have open to us for this kind of dialogue. So I would just encourage all of you um, today to um, take those <laughs> messages forward in, in your actions and your efforts to uh, ensure that human rights are, are addressed in, in environmental con uh, discussions and agreements. Thank you. Thank you very much, Tanya. So uh, again, a lot here about coherent approaches, breaking down silos, working across different sectors. Um, and I, I think that leads us nicely to, to Marcus and, and, and uh, asking for your thoughts on how to bring everything together, really, um, you know, I think the human right to a healthy environment does that for us. But, but uh, I'd say in the past couple of years, there's been um, a growing recognition of linkages between biodiversity and climate change, for sure. Uh, how do toxics fit into that puzzle? Thanks, Ben. And um, 
it, to start, I would like to also echo the, the comments uh, made by uh, Sebastian and, and Tanya in terms of um, synergies and, and coherence. Uh, on your specific uh, question, the right to a healthy environment uh, must be seen as a powerful tool to prevent harm, environmental harm of all sorts, and that includes no question hazardous uh, substances and, uh, and wastes. Uh, the element uh, that I want to come back to the element that Astrid mentioned at the very beginning of environmental defenders, uh, because the environmental defenders mobilize their communities against extractive industries, for example, that contaminate water and, uh, and air with um, dangerous pollutants. And it is the work of environmental defenders that creates visibility, that articulates uh, the defense of our environment for the benefit of all. And the right to a healthy environment adds legitimacy to their struggle. Environmental defenders are so often labeled as anti-state, anti-environment, um, and the right to a healthy environment really puts their work in the broader context of, of the public interest and the human rights uh, framework. The right to a healthy environment um, in bringing all of this together, as you're asking, can also help address gaps and enhance compliance. Uh, we've mentioned in our conversation, the Aarhus uh, Convention on, on, on Participation, Information and Justice in Environmental Matters. Uh, that convention broke ground in enabling civil society to uh, trigger compliance investigations. It's a model that has been followed elsewhere. It's a model that has been followed, that, that is under discussion in the Escazú agreement, but it's a model that has not informed various of the multilateral environmental agreements on chemicals and, and wastes. We've seen various instances of um, alleged violations of the Basel Convention, for example, in respect of uh, movement of plastic weights, wastes and the compliance committee uh, hasn't been triggered because uh, civil society has no role. And so there's an element there. There's also an element in, in thinking about uh, gaps and, uh, and, and enhancing compliance on, on the Mercury Convention. Um, the Mercury Convention has, uh, Minamata has set up very strong controls on Mercury and yet it allows for artisanal and small scale uh, gold uh, mining to continue. Um, there are action plans um, that are increasingly put in place, but this is an increasing problem that affects uh, local communities and the environment. Uh, addressing gaps, uh, next year's uh, the UN Environment Assembly's uh, fifth edition, will it take strong action to deal with plastics and plastics uh, waste or plastics along the whole stream, including production and life cycle? Uh, we've recently seen reports in the media the, in the United States, the National Public Radio released uh, an investigative report on how the plastics industry had blatantly lied about uh, recycling. Uh, recycling is not an answer. So plastics is creating a waste stream that is unmanageable and unsustainable. How will the international community respond to this global plastics problem? So that's a question of addressing gaps and enhancing compliance where the right to a healthy environment can also help. And also in terms of, uh, of effectiveness. And again here, the bridges for synergies and coherence that we've been talking about. Um, it could perhaps be summed up uh, back in 2018, the Human Rights Committee, uh, the that examines uh, compliance uh, implementation of the uh, International Covenant on, on Civil and Political Rights, released a revised general comment on, on the right to life. And one of its key points is this two street dialogue between human rights and the international environmental law, where human rights norms give content, they aid in, in the interpretation of international environmental law and vice versa, international environmental law rules and norms give content, they help in the interpretation of human rights. And that helps bridge, that creates channels for dialogue in the biodiversity space, in the climate change space, and in respect of hazardous uh, substances and wastes. So to wrap up, global recognition is, is needed today more than ever. Uh, it, the right to a healthy and sustainable environment strengthens the tools and approaches. And given the existential crisis that we face, we need as strong tools as we can muster. Thank you. Thank you very much, Marcus. Um, and so I, I think we, we heard from, from each of our previous panelists uh, really about the importance of, of participation and, and access to information and access to justice and protection 
of, of the people who defend the environment in, in some way. Uh, and, and I'll turn things over to you now, now Astrid, uh, for, for your final comments, uh, responding to that or, or anything else you would like. Um, thank you. Thank you, Ben, and again, all the organizers and the panelists. It, it has been a very important conversation, I think, that it's uh, part of the process that will continue as well. Um, and so I will wrap up with uh, just a reminder about the fact that the environment is not a separate agenda, is not a separate objective, or is not a separate um, main point of the UN. It is about the, super, the survival of the planet, and it, there, we only have one planet. And while I was listening to you and thinking about the Convention of Biological Diversity, the toxics, Minamata, etc., I was thinking about the Amazon or the ocean. It's the same ecosystem, it's the same community. And so what we need to do and thinking about the Environmental Management Group is to remind ourselves that we are connected and so that all these programs, agendas, et cetera, need to respond to today's reality. And all the data, all the reports that you mentioned uh, showed, unfortunately, that we need to start doing something different. And that different is to coordinate better and to have really people and nature in the center. And in that way, the right to a healthy environment will help a lot. The other thing is, um, and again, this can be obvious, but it's not, is that and the environmental protection is not and should not and cannot continue being only about environmentalists talking about that or indigenous peoples. We have to think and to find ways to incorporate also the financial sector, the private sector, because this is not about only ethics and treaties and international bodies. This is about the fact that we are not protecting effecti effectively and it's not even good for human rights or environmental protection and it's not for good for business and this is also shown even with the biodiversity crisis and the climate crisis that it's now even a financial risk to destroy the environment and so from all of these perspectives we definitely need to land into better um, results and the final thing that I want to mention here is to remind ourselves also about the recovery that we're seeing. Unfortunately, in many countries and many financial institutions are still doing the same thing and thinking about extractives as the way to recover. And this is exactly what we cannot make um, again. And so thinking about how to incorporate the lessons learned so that we can really use 2020 as a, in the UNFCCC, um, th that is the UNF, um, the United Nations Convention on Cli um, um, Climate Change, um, thinking about the, the, this year being the key year to start increasing ambition and doing things differently. And I think that this is the great opportunity that we have and hopefully the recognition of the right to a healthy environment will be a big step and a different message that we will hear soon from the Human Rights Council and the UN system um, as such. Thank you. Thank you very much, Astrid. Um, so really uh, uh, important messages here about how we're all connected. Um, we all are part of and reliant upon the environment and um, recognizing the human rights throughout the environment and taking rights-based environmental action uh, can help us overcome uh, many of the obstacles we're facing in pursuing equitable, inclusive, and sustainable development. Um, I will not attempt to bring everything together. We are uh, running low on time, and I want to turn things over to uh, Hossein Farai, the head of the Secretariat of the Environmental Management Group, uh, to close this discussion. Thank you uh, again to all of our panelists. Uh, a uh, warm but silent round of applause. Um, <laughs> and over to you, Hussein. Thank you, Ben. Can you hear me and see me well? Great. Um, thank you, Ben, and thank you, colleagues, for all uh, these very uh, interesting uh, contributions and discussion. It's always appealing to listen to discussions on the human rights and uh, environment uh, linkages and 
uh, I think uh, we have uh, all uh, benefited from this uh, this course of uh, thoughts. I think what we would like to really achieve uh, with the support of OSCHR and also you um, in in the hopefully forthcoming uh, uh, issue management group that we hope to establish uh, following the meeting of the ENG senior officials in October is to um, really uh, deep uh, sort of dive deep into this uh, and the EMG definitely is there to facilitate uh, an exchange of thoughts uh, not only amongst the agencies but also between the agencies of the UN and also the other partners outside uh, including the you know civil society and also the member states um, um, I, I learned a lot from this conversation I think um, describing the elements of a substantive rights for environment uh, is somehow um, sort of uh, linked and um, attached to the discussion on the uh, procedural rights. I think this, um, uh, while it is nice to have it, maybe it is also useful to uh, deep, sort of dive deep into the potentials for an, sort of enhancing the substantive rights to the environment uh, at the inter international but also at the national level. It was interesting to note that this is very interesting to know that 150 countries do have provisions relating to this right in their constitutions, but we are still lagging behind from a global recognition of this uh, at the Human Rights uh, Council level. Um, and how can the UN agencies actually enhance this recognition at the global level? Um, through their, for example, integration of the similar rights into their programming, planning, um, and, um, and in their sort of uh, support at country level through, uh, you know, the UN development assistance framework, et cetera, et cetera. So there are so many pathways that one can follow to realize the recognition of the global rights to substantive rights to the environment, taking into account, obviously, the challenges that we have in front of, the, of us in terms of the level of development. Uh, uh, in various countries and uh, issues related to equality um, uh, that uh, has uh, affected uh, a number of countries, especially in the South. Um, so we would very much like to uh, gather this information, to um, gather additional information, and hopefully once this uh, issue management group is established, make sure that first of all, we have a very good uh, reservoir of information that helps us to identify the gaps and um, the actions that are required for us to move beyond also a more of a rhetorical uh, level of discussion on, on human rights environment and, and sort of moving towards action uh, and ensuring that we have a clear set of proposals for, um, uh, for implementing and, and activating these, uh, these provisions that have been um, for a long time now in the, in the, in, in the international uh, for us. So we look forward very much uh, to the uh, next uh, round of meetings and uh, hopefully establishing the IMG and uh, looking at this issue, um, uh, as I said, um, in a much more in-depth manner in the future. And we'll be happy also to, to receive uh, views and uh, ideas from colleagues as how uh, the future work of this IMG can be shaped to make sure that we will be adding value and we will not be actually um, continue repeating what has already been said for several years on the linkages of, of the uh, human rights environment, the SDGs, on these uh, issues related to, um, to the COVID impacts and the environment and, and the human rights. Uh, we do have a reservoir of all this information we need to get into the next uh, course of action in terms of implementation, especially at the UN level playing our leading and example role uh, so that uh, the other actors can also um, follow and, and, and then uh, and pursue uh, the same level of uh, say standards and, and uh, obligations. So over to you, Ben, and thanks again to everybody who was behind. Thanks to Nina for all his, her uh, continuous support to, to organizing uh, this, uh, these events. And thank you to all the panelists who have taken their time and have come to this discussion. I always admire the participants of the human rights discussions because they come with a lot of passions. It's not like any other discussions. It's really, a, you know, they are filled with the passions.
uh, and I can feel it uh, in every uh, word that they say. So thank you so much for your uh, participation and contribution. Over to you. Ben. Thank you, Hossein. Uh, and, and I'll just um, close with, with, uh, with a big thank you to, to all of the participants and, and a reminder that these two Nexus dialogues um, the one that happened the 24th of July and the one we're concluding right now uh, will inform our work of the, you know, work with the UN Environmental Management Group on, on human rights and environment. And uh, that includes the discussion that we'll have tomorrow with UN Environmental Management Group uh, members about the potential establishment of, of an issue management group on human rights and environment which will facilitate um, better interagency coordination on rights-based environmental action uh, going forward. And, and so your support and participation in these dialogues has been invaluable and we're really grateful for that. Uh, additional information will be posted and made available on, on the website uh, with respect to these efforts and of course a report in the recording of this discussion as well. Many thanks uh, to, to Nina, Amanda, Hossein and the OHCHR and EMG teams. That's it from me, over. And Thank I, you everybody. Thank you. Thank you all. <laughs> and Goodbye. Thanks. Thank you.